All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Noble with Noble. This is episode 17, and we're getting so close to 20, and I'm excited. So today, we have uh, actually my my cousin, uh, Adam Richardson, who is one of the top uh, real estate lawyers in Toronto. And I mean, you can you can credit... Uh, Oh, thank you. It's uh, yeah, top real estate lawyer in Toronto 2022 as per Post Magazine and City on the Streets. There you go. So welcome, Adam. I'm actually very excited for the conversation because a lot of people don't know much about lawyers who are involved in real estate. Absolutely. And more than happy to chat about what our role is essentially as a real estate lawyer, how we impact the closing process, things we can do to help first time home buyers. Absolutely. But all types of purchasers, sellers, uh, it's right up our alley and we're happy to help. That's good. So yeah, so I guess tell me a little bit about uh, about what you do, where you work in and Perfect. So I'm a, with a firm. I'm one of the senior partners at Corman and Company. So we're one of the larger residential real estate law firms in the province. And we do residential real estate. So we will handle a lot of purchases, sales, certainly refinances. We do a bit of commercial as well, but the main focus is residential. And we have a team of about 15 real estate lawyers and we close transactions throughout the whole province. Our main office is in Toronto, but we do have an office in Durham, Ottawa, and we do a lawyer out in Kingston too. So we do have a pre- presence across the province altogether. And we do a large volume of transactions. We work with a lot of the top uh, real estate brokerages as well as mortgage brokerages that are out there and help service their clientele. And what we do, which we find is is a little bit different, is that we're essentially there to be providing a high level of customer service as well as quality of work. So that's really our end game. And we make things easy for a first time home buyer as well as any client that's out there. Um, We do offer virtual signing appointments so clients don't have to take time off work. They don't have to worry about coming downtown. That's really a big pain point that happened pre-COVID. So with COVID, we were able to shift and really take advantage of those video conferences, digitally hand-drawn signatures and closing that transaction virtually and getting that client uh, to the property directly after closing instead of having to go downtown, pick up keys at, from your lawyer's office and then fight through traffic and get to the house itself. So we so really- So was that not a, it wasn't a thing before? It was a, it was a very, you uh, you know, the, the, the legal industry is slow to change. So beforehand, you really had to be physically present at your lawyer's office. And again, you're working with people who are regularly working nine to five with professionals who are working generally nine to five and trying to make those schedules align. And that can be very difficult. And certainly... Um, it's just there's so much stress that can come from a real estate transaction. You're moving, you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, the colors of the walls, you're packing. All of these other aspects are in place. Let's take one of those stresses off a uh, client's table. And now they don't have to worry about making that extra time. And they can just, at their convenience, really from anywhere in the world, log in, be available, and sign those tr- closing documents with their lawyer. So that's, that's absolutely That's perfect. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's, again, so much easier, you know this virtual digital stuff has been here for so many years and it took a pandemic to finally shift into it it was the one silver lining that came out of the pandemic it was definitely uh, hard for a lot of people but it was that you know impetus for change within the legal industry itself and there are some firms who've been able to take advantage of it and build out those structures to support their clients and there are others that still are forcing you to come into office so we're able to be on the side that make that's really on the client side for making that transaction a lot smoother so that's yeah that's absolutely what we do something else that we do as well is uh, there are so many status certificates and pre-construction agreements that need to be reviewed. And those are done by real estate lawyers. So whether you're that buyer who is purchasing that pre-construction unit or you're offering on a condo and you need a status certificate reviewed, typically speaking, you would be sending that deal in to your lawyer and asking them to review the status certificate. We understand that timing is a huge factor in the industry. So we actually have a document review department that their whole job is status certificate and pre-construction reviews. So you we're sending in the deal. They're getting on it right away. Of course, this is done in conjunction with a lawyer, but we're able to speed up that process. And we can actually do pre-offer status certificate reviews, which really gives buyers that competitive edge in the industry because it's one less condition that they're able to submit an offer on the basis of. And again, it makes their offer more competitive in a, in a multiple offer 
of situation. Right. So what is a status certificate for those Great who question. don't know? So condo corporations are required at law to give you a summary essentially on the health of the condo corporation itself. So a status certificate will tell you whether or not the unit owner is in arrear. So if they haven't been paying their maintenance fees, but more importantly, it will tell you, are there legal proceedings? So is the condo court being sued? Are they suing other people? Are you having to worry about uh, special assessment? So not having enough money in a condo corporation to cover the maintenance and operations of the condo itself and therefore them having to levy one-time collections against unit owners. That's a very important piece, especially if you're buyer and you're just pushing yourself to buy that property. Having, you know, facing a special assessment in the near future is a problem for you. It's also a problem for your lender. So it's something that we take a look at as well. There's something called a reserve fund study. So every condo corporation has to do a 30-year plan based on its maintenance and repair needs and engineers do it and they prepare a funding plan and what we take a look at is we're looking at whether the balance that's in the fund actually aligns with that uh, recommended plan we look at the audited financials there are all of these different components the other piece that's really important for uh, home buyers is what are those restrictions in place mainly with respect to pets as well as renting out a property because if you have that 85 pound dog and your condo corp restricts you to 35 pounds or you have three dogs and you can only have two dogs in your property you have a problem a dog is a family member we find that that matters a lot for people uh, as well renting so if your intention was to perhaps engage in short-term rentals or you wanted to have the flexibility to have multiple longer-term rentals in a property um, in a given year you may be restricted so we do have to take a look at what those rules are what those restrictions are and all of that information is provided up front so that allows a buyer a to be satisfied with what it is that they're actually purchasing it gives them more confidence but if whether it's done before an offer is made to make your offer more competitive or being done once the offer is signed as part of a due diligence period, it gives that buyer more confidence, again, in what it is that they're actually purchasing. Yeah, because so there, there are some people who, you know, want to buy a property to rent out as an Airbnb mm-hmm. or some people want to buy it as an investment property to rent exactly. out permanently. And, and it's so different between being able to rent it out to somebody and Airbnb because I feel like most most condo buildings nowadays don't allow Airbnbs and the ones that do are a mess. So they, that is like, it's a fairly accurate description. So most condo corporations, um, because Airbnb, Airbnb is looked at as potentially commercial activity. So you are in the business of short-term rentals. It could impact the condo corp's insurance overall. It could impact property taxes as well. Instead of being assessed as residential, it's possible that you could be assessed as commercial. These are considerations and pain points for a lot of buildings. So building the other aspect of as well is, A longer term tenant, hopefully, but certainly an end user, so a unit owner, is more likely to comply with the rules of a condo corporation and have a better lifestyle for the building overall. So they're very sensitive. Remember, these rules are being set and they're in place by the unit owners themselves. They comprise the board of directors. These are very much so self-managed. They have property management companies that help them, but the board itself are those unit owners. So these these are sensitivities, and you certainly would rather know this information ahead of time as opposed to close, try to put a short term tenant in there and find out that you're actually prohibited from doing so. Right. So that's the purpose of a real estate lawyer is to check everything, all the papers and I guess the the tough stuff behind the scenes. It's definitely one of the functions. Absolutely. We take a look at title as well. So uh, one of the big parts of our job is making sure that you're going to obtain title free and clear. So you're not taking it subject to liens or other people's debts or other people's mortgages, like their registered mortgages on title. So that's part of a, a function of what we do. We also handle the lender's money. So on the purchase side of a transaction, we generally are acting for the major banks as well as the other institutional lenders. So they're advancing the funds to us. We're we're using that money to make sure that it, the deal actually closes and a valid first mortgage is being registered. And the actual main component of what we do is you cannot buy or sell property in terms of the closing itself in the land registry without a lawyer. So you cannot transfer title from one person to another without a real estate lawyer. So with all of that in mind, we're dealing with um, assisting on the due diligence at the front end before these deals actually firm up. For example, status certificate reviews or pre-construction agreement reviews. We're going through the actual process of searching title, coordinating with the client, figuring out what those title instructions are gonna look like, working with the lender as well to get that money, to get their documentation in, meeting those clients 
clients to sign up all of those documents and actually facilitating the closing of the transaction and getting title registered into their name. So there are a lot of functions of a real estate lawyer throughout the process of a transaction, especially when you have a situation that might be a little bit trickier and you need advice before your deal firms up or maybe even before you offer on a deal. You'll reach out, engage a real estate lawyer at that time uh, just so that you can get that proper legal advice before you're proceeding with the transaction. And uh, I just have to make one point. So while we are talking about a lot of legal concepts here today, all of this information is of a generalized nature. It is not to be construed as actual legal advice. If you have any personal questions, feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to help. We just have to make sure that everybody's aware. <laughs> just, as a lawyer, you need Sorry. to make sure that you, that you cover yourself too. So what's the difference between uh, doing like a freehold property and a condo besides just a status certificate? So the main difference between the two is actually the uh, legal ownership structure itself. So with a freehold property, you own the dirt. So you own that house, let's call it a detached house. You own that detached house, you own the dirt that it's sitting on as well. Um, with a condominium corporation, it's a, you know, everyone talks about a box in the sky. That's essentially what it is. You have an interest in a legal ownership, which is a condominium type property, which in and of itself is an interest in a condominium corporation. So you don't own that dirt on the ground. You don't necessarily have the same maintenance obligations that you would have with a freehold property because your condo corporation could be handling some of that maintenance, uh, those maintenance requirements. For example, with a condo, generally everything within the four walls is the unit owner's responsibility. Every Everything outside of those four walls is the condo corporation's responsibility. In a freehold, whatever your rectangle or lot looks like, all of it is your maintenance responsibility. So that's a huge factor. And your ability to future develop a property, I don't think that's um, necessarily what the average buyer is really looking for. But in theory, if you are owning freehold and you're assembling lots themselves, you have the ability to subdivide with a lot of work, but you have the ability to subdivide. If you buy a condo corp, in theory, it's already a, a, a unit in a condo corp, it's already developed property. So you're not doing anything further with respect to that. But aside from those differences, very much so the same. You can add other people on title with you as uh, joint tenants, which is something that we can talk about in a little bit. So you can t pass the properties down to, you, uh, to your estate, to your beneficiaries, to spouses. You still have that flexibility. You're able to mortgage both types of properties. Um, and really your your deed itself, so the ownership in the land registry is still reflected that you own something. So from those perspectives, they're quite similar. It's really just the question of like the the dirt as well as the um, the maintenance and repair obligations. Okay, yeah. So as a first time home buyer, yeah. um, you know, at what point would I reach out to a real estate lawyer? And then once I do reach out to a real estate lawyer, let's say I'm, I guess we'll, we'll give two examples. Yeah. One that I am the sole person on title mm -hmm. and two let's say i have a lender or a parent or someone to help me out with title what's the difference between the two because i know that you know obviously if if you're the only person on title right then the whole responsibility is on you but if there are other people who are helping invest yeah. then it's probably different so it's, it's a good question so to the first part of when do i actually reach out to that real estate lawyer in a perfect world, you would reach out to your real estate lawyer before you've even put an offer in. Generally speaking, what we see are that those offers are first signed, you're working with your realtor, you're finding that property, and then you're engaging a real estate lawyer to help with the rest of the process. We're more than happy to help ahead of time, but generally speaking, we're retained once the offer is signed, and it's our job to review a status certificate if that condition exists, but otherwise to execute the terms of the agreement itself. So typically what I would recommend is you've signed that piece of paper, you get in, in touch with a real estate lawyer. For example, if you're reaching out to our firm, at that point, we provide a full quote up front. So we'll give you an itemized breakdown of what you're looking for in terms of your closing costs. Once that's approved, the offer is actually opened on our end and we then send you an introductory letter. So that's when you're dealing with the engagement of the lawyer, you're responding to their questions, you're organizing your financing as needed. But let's assume that one person is on title alone, they go through that process, they're meeting with the lawyer, they're signing all of those closing documents themselves, and they own the property 100%. So that's perfectly fine. In a situation where you have multiple individuals, so the biggest example that we certainly see, especially for a first time home buyer, is you need a parent to help you qualify for the financing. That is a very real problem in the world today. And the benefit is that if you are able to use that parent to help qualify for that mortgage, and you have the down payment that's in place, 
remember that you're qualifying for more than your actual interest rate. So you may be able to pay the monthly mortgage amount, but you may not qualify itself. So that's an example of where a parent may go on title with you. The problem that we often see is that if your, if your parent goes on title with you just equally, you have a problem because your parent isn't actually living at the property with you. And they are just going on title really for mortgage qualification purposes. So when that type of structure happens, it's typically um, a good idea to consider whether or not you wanna have a 99 and one split. And what that means is that 99% of the property is held by that first time home buyer, the person who's actually living at the property, and 1% is held by the parent who's really only on there for mortgage qualification purposes. What's the benefit of that type of structure? Well. As that person who is a first time home buyer is qualifying for a first time home buyer rebate, they're going to claim 99% of that figure. Assuming that they've been living at the property throughout the duration of their ownership of, of of the property itself as their primary place of residence, they will then qualify for 99% of the principal residence exemption at the time of sale. So that's huge tax savings. For those that don't know, when you do sell a property and it was not your principal place of residence, you are paying generally a capital gain. So what that means is that half of the profit is taxable at your marginal tax rate. So rule of thumb generally is 25% of the gain is the tax that you'd otherwise be paying. That's a lot of tax. That's a lot, yeah. It's a lot of tax. So in order to avoid that, if you're maxing out, out, out the ability to claim that first time, uh, sorry, that principal residence exemption, you can avoid a lot of the tax you'd be paying on that disposition of the property. The 1%, on the other hand, is limiting their capital gains exposure. So when that property is sold, you're looking at a 1% interest of half of the profit at their marginal tax rate. This is peanuts in the grand scheme of things. So you get you have that, that ability of being able to, again, max out your maxing out your first time home buyer rebate, maxing out really the principal residence exemption and limiting your parents' capital gain exposure in the future. The flip side too is that a lot of people will refinance in the future and remove that parent from title. And when you're only removing a 1% interest, again, the land transfer tax on, on the transfer is 1% of the assumed value of the mortgage, which again is a very small amount. So these are very legal concepts, but the idea is, is that 99 and one split is a great way for people to be able to get uh, on title with that parent for a qualifying purpose. So I was gonna say, would it be more beneficial to do the 99 and one, or you know, let's say the parent gives you that money as a gift, mm -hmm. and then you use that towards it instead of having their name on it? That's great. Generally speaking, they're still gifting a portion of the down payment, but you need them on there to qualify for the mortgage. So you need their income in order for the lender to look and say, yes, these two people together will be able to pay the mortgage. Because from the lender's perspective, the parent is just as liable for the mortgage as the kid. They only have a 1% interest in the property, but to the lender, they are responsible for technically 100% of the mortgage if the kid doesn't pay. So from the lender's perspective, they're comfortable. From the parent's perspective, it's more tax efficient and that that would essentially be the idea there are other ways to take title and we do see that certainly it's less common so the two ways that you would generally be taking title are joint tenants or tenants in common when there are multiple people on title joint tenants means last remaining survivor acquires the whole of the property so if you have two spouses that are on title, one of them passes, the other inherits the property automatically by way of registered survivorship. It passes outside of the estate, no estate administration tax, no land transfer tax, it's just an automatic transfer to the other person. Tenants in common means if whatever respective owner passes, it goes to their estate and then their will would dictate who actually receives that ownership interest. So in the 99-1 situation, you have to do tenants in common. Uh, a joint tenancy situation is you equally own all of the property. So if you were to take title with your parent jointly, that's better for estate planning. For example, if you pass, your parent gets the property, you don't have to worry about going through the courts and estate administration tax. You don't have to deal with any of that. But from a tax point of view, if you don't die and you sell the property, you're paying way more tax. So there are pros and cons to both options. The 99 and one, generally speaking, is more attractive when you don't foresee a you know major health event and, and a change essentially with respect to those owners. Right, okay. No, that, that's really good information because there are a lot of people that really don't know about that. So 100%. tell me a little bit about closing costs because you, know, you mentioned it earlier, but a lot of people don't know what closing costs are how much that's going to run you? Because you said, you know, once you sign that paper, uh, you know, you're going to go and and give that to the real estate lawyer. You're going to quote them for, you know, whatever. But how do people know how much to? How do they know how much to budget for? Essentially, how much to budget I think, for? I think it's and, a good question. Yeah. So if you're if you're really 
looking in the market and 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 you're tight you know you're like you're very tight with respect to your closing costs themselves or or just how much you can possibly afford it's a good idea to reach out in advance and what we do again is we have this closing cost calculator so we'll break down a full quote we'll give you the legal fee amount the legal fee can change based on the type of property that you're dealing with and essentially the risk exposure of of the transaction itself but the big numbers the big numbers that you're talking about are land transfer tax like that's the huge figure it is on a um it's on a, like essentially a sliding scale. So you pay different amounts of money on each portion of the purchase price. So there are tons of land transfer tax calculators out there. We have one on our website as well. Definitely recommend uh, taking a look or just reach out and we're happy to give a quote. Title insurance is another one. That one is generally 0.1% of your purchase price plus PST. So it's that 8%. And that's a one-time payment that lasts for your entire duration of ownership of the property. It's something that you will effectively be required to obtain, but in theory, it is optional. You just will not find a real estate lawyer that'll close your transaction without it. Just its price point. Um, and then aside from that, you have some registration fees. These are, you're talking about a couple hundred bucks. Those aren't significant, but the big one is the land transfer tax. And that's the hard one to ascertain. So again, it really depends on that price point. You also have to consider that if you're buying within the city of Toronto, you're paying a second land transfer tax, which is called that municipal land transfer tax. Yeah, it's an extra. It's double. It's yeah, I was going to say. Double. The taxes is, are the same. Is it 4% that goes up to eight? No, or no, no. I'm that thinking, might be I'm thinking combined, of else. possibly, but it's yeah. it's roughly in the realm of like two, two and a half, but dependent on your price point. And again, different portions of your purchase price are subject to different amounts of tax. Right. It's same thing as income tax. It's on like a gradient scale, so you pay different amounts of land, of income tax based on different amounts of income earned. Yeah, because so, I know idea. if you're living outside of Toronto and yeah. you still have a house, yeah. and you move to Toronto, you still have to pay. Oh yeah, that, you're, that you're, double, you're definitely paying it. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, yes, we definitely hear that where clients will say, oh, you know, this is the welcome tax for the city of Toronto. It is more money than buying outside of the city of Toronto. This is true. But uh, generally speaking, and we'll see based on the future, but living in the city of Toronto means generally because they have this other source of revenue there are lower property taxes in proportion to the purchase price so the other municipalities while in theory they have the ability to levy these municipal land transfer taxes those are um, turnoffs for buyers they just view that as a really high upfront cost to move outside of the city so in turn higher annual property taxes so it's something to keep in mind they have to fund their balance sheet some way so whether you're, it's an upfront tax or it's a recurring tax you know, so, you know, if you're really looking at it, you could say, how long do I have to stay in this property in order to pay back the increased amount of property tax or the property tax that I'm saving by living in the city as opposed to moving outside of the city? And I mean, 10, 14 years, but it depends on the property. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, a, a, it's a very, it's, uh, it's a very gray. Yeah. But gray people area. live in the city of Toronto for lots of reasons, you know, lifestyle, job, family. There are obviously a lot of people that live in the city and are willing to pay that municipal land transfer tax. So it's just, more so of a reality of what you're budgeting for as opposed to the deterrent of whether you should be buying in the city or not. Right. So yeah, I guess it's it's super important to be using a real estate lawyer because a lot of people, again, number one, don't know about these things. And number two, you're useful because you make the the job easier for them when 100%. they're doing these closing costs, right? So what, yes. I, I know we sort of spoke about what you do, but what would the process be like if I were to buy my first house and the communication that we would have because I know that there are due diligence things that you need to do before that you know, we would have to be in communication for. 100%. So let's say you've bought that first house. So you've been working with your realtor. You've been successful with your offer. That's fantastic. So your first step is that you need to engage a real estate lawyer. So you reach out to a real estate lawyer. Let's say you're coming to Corman and Company, and that is my firm, of course. So you reach out to us. We'll provide you with a quote. We also give you an overview of the process up front. So we let you know about how we're going to take in your file. We're going to send you an introductory letter. We're going to be dealing with the title search. You're going to be dealing with organizing financing with your lender and then roughly two one to two weeks before your closing we'll actually meet together and that's now through a video conference we're going to go through all of your closing documents which are a mix of documents relating to the purchase that we prepare and the documents relating to your mortgage that are instructed by your lender sometimes we're using their form sometimes we're preparing documentation we sign everything up we collect the funds from you as well and then come closing we actually complete the deal 
if you were buying a condo, really the biggest difference there is that there that is that initial status certificate review conditional period that will be um, involving us as well, right? We need the documentation, we have to go through it, we have to give you that written review, and then we have to be available to answer your questions to make sure that you are comfortable with the review and you're ready to proceed. So that does happen at the onset of a condominium transaction. Okay, so the money comes out of the closing, like once once it closes, so I don't need to pay money up front, similar to a realtor, you don't need to pay the money up front. It depends. Uh, no, like you're not paying us money. Like you're not paying money to us up front, 100%. Right. But in order to close the deal, we have to have the money to pay land transfer tax, to pay the seller to complete the transaction. So you're bringing in the money generally about one to two days before your closing date. And then on the closing date, we already have your money. So that's the remainder of your down payment plus your closing costs. And then on that day, the lender is advancing the mortgage money. So now we have all of the money we need to close your deal. We pay the vendor their amount of money. And then once we've hit register, the land registry takes out of our account the land transfer tax that's payable. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's a lot. And some people think, you know, like I don't, obviously we spoke that you, that you do need a lawyer, but yeah. you know, Oh, I don't want to pay this person and that person and whatever. Like I have my budget of whatever I want to pay for my place, but now I have all these costs on top of it that are gonna. So with a with a real estate lawyer, there really is a huge difference in quality throughout the industry. So I'd be very careful, and I'd say that as a word of caution to buyers that are really looking at saving pennies at the end of the transaction. For the difference of a few hundred dollars, you can go, unfortunately, to some firms that are not paying full attention or perhaps there's more of a clerk involvement on the file as opposed to a lawyer involvement or a lack of communication or updating um, as to process with a client itself. And they can have a much more stressful process with respect to closing. At our firm, what we do and what we do a little bit differently is We'll have a partner on your file, generally speaking, an associate as well, as well as one of our top law clerks. And we're able to work together as a team to service your clients. So what that means is that we're following up with respect to questions that they may have, making sure that they have filed the information, such as the introductory letter. Do they have questions with respect to financing? Do they need us to help coordinate with their banker to make sure that that financing comes through and make sure that there's a smooth closing process overall? The biggest problem that arises where people get themselves in trouble, I guess there are two. One is you have a problem that comes up between the time that you've signed your offer and closing and you don't have that legal support. So that's why it's very important to have a lawyer who is on your side and is available and has that time for you. The other problem is that if your lawyer doesn't do the proper due diligence, then you don't find out that there's a problem with your property until you're selling it in the future and that next buyer's lawyer is doing their due diligence. So there's really a hope with those situations that the property was clean to begin with and everything will be fine, but you don't find out your damages or like that harm much further into the future. So that's something certainly to keep in mind, but you do need a lawyer absolutely to help with the transaction. I think it pays um, certainly in dividends to have somebody who's on your side that's giving you that proper information that can help you out with those oddities as well. And uh, altogether, it just means it's a smoother closing experience. It's essentially an extension of the experience that they've had with their realtor and their mortgage broker should continue on with their lawyer. Yeah, because it's it's just like using a lawyer for anything, right? You, right. You're not going to go to court and just go by yourself. You can have all the evidence you you need. You can have all the you know the the backing information, and you can know that you know, you're, you're going to win. But if you don't have a lawyer there, they may not know how to deliver it properly. Exactly, <laughs> or, so. or what what arguments may matter more um, than otherwise. So yes, there's certainly an the aspect of oh well, I can do it all myself, except that I just need a lawyer to click a register button. It doesn't work that way in reality. So it is a you know they're an important stakeholder throughout the transaction. Again, along with your realtor and your mortgage. Yeah, broker, I think so the realtor is also just important, right? There are a lot of people who are like, oh, important. why do I need a realtor? You know, like I can go look up houses on whatever realtor.ca by myself and like I don't need anyone to do anything for me. But then when it comes down to it to do all the paperwork and everything, you need to make sure that you have that offers, knowing what is reasonable, what will be competitive, having relationships in a network. There are so many reasons why a realtor is important. And it's the same kind of idea. Again, you should be always working with a strong team of trusted professionals around you to really make sure that you have that competitive edge in your offers and that you're protected all the way up to and including after closing. So yeah, so I got one, one more question. We're almost at the end. So for a first time home buyer, uh, how much can you get for a rebate? 
and I know that there are some conditions that happen within that as hundred well, percent. So. so, yeah. So if you're buying within the province itself, that's a $4,000 rebate from land transfer tax with the Ministry of Finance. And it is net, so it's instant. You're bringing in that much money, less the $4,000, provided that you're a first-time home buyer. With the City of Toronto, it's the same starting point in land transfer tax that you'd be paying, but you get $4,475 off of the land transfer tax payable. And just to be clear, this is not a check that they're cutting back to you no matter what the land transfer tax you paid. It's a max maximum amount of land transfer tax that you can reduce against uh, the net amount that you owe to them. So there's neg never a negative figure, but it can go all the way down to zero depending on your purchase price. To be a first time home buyer for land transfer tax purposes, you cannot have owned property anywhere in the world. You cannot have inherited it before, been married to somebody who has owned property. You have to be moving in within the first nine months as your primary place of residence, and you have to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident of Canada. So all of those conditions have to be met for any of the parties that are on title who are claiming the first time home buyer rebate. So that is certainly an important aspect just to be aware of. The one loophole that we often see is in a situation where somebody has separated from their spouse in the past and they had owned property in the past, but they have now been essentially been married to a new first time home buyer and they are buying property jointly, it's a very limited exception, you can get the rebate again. But aside from that, if you have owned property anywhere in the world in the past, you do not qualify for that rebate. So again, if that is the make or break for whether you can afford that property, it's really important. Reach out to a lawyer in advance, find out how you qualify, and that will help you make an informed decision when you purchase. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, it does uh, a lot of information packed in, but I My do, pleasure. do really appreciate it. I think, yeah, when we were talking before about uh, the land transfer tax, and I said the four percent. I think I was thinking of the four thousand dollars as a exactly. first time home buyer rebate, and I think I just got them. Hundred percent. So it's it's a great opportunity. What I would say is there's so much information with respect to a purchase transaction. It's of course important chat with your realtor about it for sure. But also if if you you have clients who are uncertain, um, I would definitely encourage them reach out. Let's have a conversation. We're always happy to do so and give them a little bit more direction or comfort with respect to their questions before they put in that offer. That's great. Yeah. So I guess uh, we usually do you know like where can people find you online? But I know you're not a big. Uh, not a big social media guy, but yes, you know, exactly. I guess email or email website. And, and my website. So my email is adam at cormancompany.com, K O R M A N C O M P A M Y.com, or you can visit our website at cormancompany.com and you can definitely reach out to us. Uh, email is definitely the best way, but you can always give us a call. Phone number is listed on the site as well. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Adam. I really my appreciate pleasure, you, uh, you coming and giving us that insight. And thank you, you for know, having if me. If anyone has any questions, yeah, reach out to Adam and you know, he'd be happy to help. And I know, you know, after winning an award of being a top uh, real estate lawyer, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been, he's, he's a trusted guy. So thank you. I've been doing it for a decade and uh, I'm more than happy to help. Exactly. So thanks, thanks everyone. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Take care.